I often say to you, I'm talking about the Man of War Church, that your focus and your purposeful attention to the lost and your desire to see souls saved has made you a very special church. I, I sense in the age that we're living that a lot of people don't really know why the church exists. But you know that. Last Sunday, five people gave their heart to the Lord. Sunday before that, nine people gave their heart to the Lord. And we care. We pray for that. That's, that's why we attend church. That's why we pray. That's why we give generously. That's why we study the Word of God. Not so that we will be smart and, and high-minded and self-righteous. We do all those things so that the world will be saved and that nobody will go to hell. We understand our assignment and our purpose. And, and we are about not only leading people to Christ, but making disciples. That's, that's what our, our, our mission is. And, and, and so for all that we've done, we know that there's still so much more to do. And even though that God is blessing this church, we don't deserve any of those blessings. I, I mean, we need to understand that. There isn't anything that we can do of ourselves that would somehow put us in line for his blessings, but he blesses us. I haven't even seen the numbers for last month, but, but giving was a record uh, in the month that just ended. And, and, and that's because God is blessing you. You wouldn't have it to give. And God is blessing you and blessing this church. And we understand that that could stop at any moment, but I want us to recognize that there is a wind at our back right now. Uh, there's a wind in our sails. Rick Warren in his book, The Purpose Driven Church, said only God can make a wave. And all we can do is ride it. God is the, is the wind. We can just lift our sails, right? And so during a time that we sense specifically that not only are we on task and on mission and we understand our assignment and our purpose, we also realize that this is a special time in the time of this church. And you are the church. The church here is not a denomination, not an organization, uh, not a group. It, it, you are the ecclesia, the called out ones. And for some reason right now there's a wind to our back. And so there's a lot to be done, and our assignment is very real. I believe that God has given me a message that's very specific for us today. But before I wade into it, I want to say to us, because we sense our purpose, and we realize at any moment that God could lift the wind. See, we can't make it. We can just hoist our sails according to it. And because the wind could cease and go somewhere else, and because there are tens of thousands within a stone's throw of our doors that don't know Jesus then we've got to be about the Father's business and work while it is day, for night comes when no man can work. So that means we have to be aggressive in praying, aggressive in seeking God for souls. We have to be aggressive in loving others and making sure that they know that we love them. Even while we were yet in our sins, He loved us and died for us. How can we not love others who are yet blinded by their own sin? So we want to love them and help them to come to Jesus and connect to a body of Christ and grow into mature disciples. And we know here that a disciple is not even a disciple until they have made a disciple. I mean, what would happen if each one won one and next year each of those won one? And by the doubling, the, God is a multiplier. We find in the New Testament again and again he referred to the crowd as multitudes. That is a derivative of the word multiples. God is a multiplier. Satan is a divider. A subtractor, but God is an adder and a multiplier. And He wants to add to the church daily such as should be saved. I'm hungry for that. I, I, I'm tired, Misty, of just being a weekend church. I don't want to just win people to Jesus anymore on Sunday. I want us to find ourselves about the Father's business every single day of our life until He comes. Amen. So let's read this passage from Luke chapter 5 beginning in verse 1. I'm reading actually from the New King James Version. It's so, it's so it was. As the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God that he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two boats standing by the lake. But the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats which was Simon's and asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. 
But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have, toiled all, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. And I love this next phrase. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. I want to interrupt this and say, this passage is not about fishing at all. He said, later I will make make you fishers of men. God wants to send so many souls to this church and every church in this city that we break apart, our nets break, and our buildings virtually sink because we would not be able to handle the capacity of lost souls. Are you getting the picture? This is a divine thing that's taking place here. This is not a story about fishing and prosperity at all. It's not about that at all. Verse 9. I'm sorry, verse 8, when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' feet, saying, Depart from me, for I am sinful man, O Lord. Trudy, he said, I have seen myself, and I'm an unclean man, and I have unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. He was humbled by the presence of a sovereign God and the awesomeness of his power. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of the fish which they had taken. And also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will catch men. So they, took, so they brought their boats to land. They forsook all and followed him. Sold out. Everything changed at that moment. The real meaning, I'm just going to wade into this and not spend all day. The real meaning of the text is so much more than a story of miraculous provision. Sometimes we need to preach about this and the miraculous provision. I know that the disciples were about to begin a journey into ministry, Josh Johns. They were about to be go, go into a place they had never been. They were about to leave their studied occupations and their professions, and they were going to go someplace else, and we, we don't know the extent and the value of those two fish, fish, fishing boats that day, but perhaps that day Jesus gave them enough money in their saving accounts to sustain their ministry for decades. We don't know. And so sometimes we need provision. Sometimes we need a miracle. Sometimes we need God to show up. Sometimes there's too much month at the end of the money. But this story is not about that. And I'll tell you before I go further, one of the things that bugs me about the Western culture version of the gospel is that it is always about money. It's always about the blessings of God. It's always about all the good things that God will do for you if you'll just give your heart to Jesus. It's like we're paying or rewarding or somehow trying to tempt or tease people to come to Jesus because suddenly they'll be better citizens and have more money and get it to go out to eat more often. Honey, that ain't it. And we've made it all about that. I know that God is a good God and that He knows how to bless His people, but there's much more to this than that. He did not send His only Son into the world so that you would have an easier life and more money. He can't send His Son to die on a cross so that you would be safe from a devil's hell and live throughout eternity with Him. It's deeper. It's time for us to go deeper and not remain shallow and understand that God has a great calling upon all of us. So they were stunned by the enormity of the catch. So much so it opened a door of opportunity for Jesus to speak to them. So, so soul winning is about far more than we can do. It is about His authority. Catching fish is about more than skill and good nets and find boats. Do you hear what I'm saying? Being successful in winning souls is about far more than fine architecture, far more than skilled oratory, far more than fine music. Winning the lost is about the authority of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit to attract fish, men. He, can, he was saying, look, you fished all night, you know all the good fishing holes, you fished all night. They didn't fish all night and catch a couple little fish. They fished all night with their deep sea radar, with dynamite. Whatever they used, they fished all night and caught nothing. They were exhausted. They had cleaned their nets and put it all away, and the deal was done. But Jesus was speaking with a different kind of authority. 
Listen, he said, my sheep know my voice. You can be sure his fish do too. If he can speak to stars and they sing back at him, you can be sure that he can call the fish. He demonstrated a miracle that caught them off guard. It is by the power and the authority of Jesus Christ that the multitude of fish found their way into the nets so much so that they broke the nets and nearly sank the boats. And it is by the authority and the power of Jesus that the lost men and women of the city will find their way to the Bible teaching, Bible believing churches of this city and that revival will come to our city and to our state and to our nation once again. It will be by His authority. So, there are some things that are revealed to us in this lesson that I want you and I to get. Jesus transforms this boat, so to speak, into an instrument of evangelism. Some of you might have a hard time why I want you to respect what looks like a, a National Guard armory or something. We built the gym first here, and we don't have a sanctuary because we didn't build one. We built a gym. And so some people want to bring their coffee and their soft drink in here and treat it like a gym. It has been transformed by the authority of Jesus Christ into a sanctuary for saving the lost. And so we ought to treat it like that. Jesus, by his presence, turned an ordinary fishing boat into a vessel of salvation. And he stepped up into the boat and he said, put out into the deep. I wanted to spend a whole hour preaching about putting out into the deep. I believe that it is time for the Man of War Church to put ourselves out into the deep so that we will be in the position to actually reach the lost and dying of our city. To put out into the deep is to go beyond the walls of this building and go into the marketplace, go into the apartment complexes, go into the businesses and to the high offices of this city, go wherever God sends us and there do our fishing. He said, go ye therefore into the highways and to the hedges and compel them to come in to my house. That's our assignment, to put out into the deep. He said, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we worked all night and caught nothing, but I will do as you say and let down the nets. So the catch is so amazing that the nets are breaking. And the word that is used to describe the large catch, interestingly, holy ghostly, is the same Greek word that is used over and over in the book of Acts to describe the size of the crowd. The crowds were not large. They were a word that we interpret as being multitude. But here it was interpreted as a large catch rather than a multitude of fish. And so Jesus says to Simon after the catch of fish in verse 10, Do not fear, from now on you will be catching men. The multitude of fish caught by Jesus was used that day to demonstrate his authority to empower his followers to catch men. I mean, they looked like great fishers, fishermen that day, didn't they? I don't know about you, but I'm tired of five and nine. I just am. Five and nine ain't enough. Lexington is the top 25 fastest growing city in America. Five and nine does not keep up with our rate of growth. That means way too many people are going to hell within the shadow cast of our building. And it's not that we are alone. There are literally hundreds of thousands of square feet of churches all across this city. They ought to be full every Sunday morning and throughout the week of men and women crying out to God. And so we've got to put out into the deep. It says here in, in Acts chapter 5 verse 14, And believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. This was not happening because Peter was a skilled preacher. This was not happening because they had great architectural edifices with great sound systems. It happened because of the authority and the power of Jesus Christ to attract the lost men and women to him. So he can do it. He can do it for you and I. But we've got to get some things going. See, Jesus said... In Matthew 28 and 18, that all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Matthew 28, 18 and 19. 
Jesus Christ is the decisive power and authority in winning people to Jesus Christ. Now, can you say amen? He is the definitive authority and power. So why isn't it happening? Jesus used his power and authority to collect and drive the fish into the nets. But the evangelists, the fishermen, had to put out into the deep. They had to gather up the nets and throw them over the side. Then they were the ones that had to do the back-breaking labor of getting the fish in the boat and getting the boats to shore. Now you're getting your part. Peter said, we are war smack out. Are you kidding, Pastor? We just gave away everything that we have two weeks ago. Now you're asking for more. I'm simply saying God has promised a return on your investment. You gave thousands of dollars and we don't want thousands of dollars back. We want the souls of this city. The seed that was sown, we want it back in the souls of this town. Nothing else will satisfy. Give me souls ere I die. Reinhard Bonnke said, hell empty, heaven full. God, every single soul in this city we claim in the name of Jesus. Send them into our nets. My God, we've been, we've been having Bible studies for 75 years. This church was running 315 years ago. I understand according to Barna, no church growth in any county, in any state in America in 20 years. Enough Bible studies, my God. Enough acting like a church. It's time to cast out into the deep and, and roll up some sleeves and throw the nets over the edge and pray the Holy Ghost will do His power and fill the nets to breaking. I want, some, I want some problems. We've had some problems here. I want some problems that will put the dinky problems we've had in perspective. I want us running out of toilet tissue in the bathroom every service. I want the commodes clogged up so we got to have a full time somebody in the bathroom just to ten. I want kids pouring out of the kids' wing for everybody saying, but pastor, we don't have room anymore. I want the teens crammed full where there's no more space. I want a service on Saturday night and five or six or seven services on Sunday. How about a Wednesday morning 10 a.m. service for all the people that work the night shift in the city? How about... How about calling the God of authority and power into account and saying, we will, at thy word, we'll put down the nets. But if you don't do something, we fist all night. We know we're wasting our time. I'm tired of wasting my time. I want the souls of the city. They are available to you and I. Here are the four characteristics of people who go man fishing. Four characteristics of people who go man fishing. Number one, they teach the Word of God. It happened that while the crowd was pressing around him, and listening to the Word of God. Can I just say this? Jesus didn't attract a big crowd with a contemporary rock and roll Christian band. Got nothing against that. But that's not how he attracted the crowd. He also didn't attract the crowd with free meals. He'd been known to feed with fishes and loads, but that day they were there for one reason. I want you to know this. You can trust the power of the truth of the Word of God to attract the lost. We live in a world that wants somebody to be real. Just tell me the truth. Tell me how it is. We're tired of the gamesmanship. We cannot trust our professors and our universities. We cannot trust our, our politicians in Washington, D.C. The world is looking for somebody who will just tell me the truth. They will be drawn to that. You know how I know? Because the man with the power and the authority will see to it that they come if we will deliver the truth. It's not enough that the truth is preached in the pulpit. It also has to be spoken in the marketplace by men and women like you. Man, fishers like you have to speak the truth. Come down off your high horse. Don't be afraid to tell somebody, I once was blind, but now I see. I used to wallow in drunkenness. I used to be out in sin. I was a woman chaser. I chased in skirts. I was worse than uh, Samson. You know, Samson was a fox chaser. He chased the four-legged kind and the two-legged kind. And just for the record, man, it got his eyes put out. 
But you need to know the truth. You're made overcomers by the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony. Tell the truth and know the word of God and preach it. They preach the truth. Luke makes it very clear that, can I use this word? Dare I use this word to fish for men? The bait that Jesus used was the truth of the word of God. That's what we need to do. We don't need to dress it up. We don't need to water it down. We don't need to add a little sugar and make it sweet. There's a whole sweet blending cocktail that the denominations of America have created that we have been drinking for generations and it's done nobody any good. It's time for the unpolluted truth of the Word of God. The Word of God is the greatest word there is. It's not a little jingle designed to manipulate people into buying our church product. The Word of God will change the lives of men and when men's lives have been changed, they can say, as the old song said, I said I wasn't going to tell anybody, but I couldn't keep it to myself. No, I couldn't keep it to myself what the Lord has done for me. When people's lives are changed, you can't hide it. You cannot hide it. The second thing, the second characteristic of man fishers, people who fish for men, they obey the commands of Jesus. Jesus told Simon, push out into the deep and put down your nets. Well, I love his great faith. He's like so many of us. Well, we've been doing this for 75 years now. And we ain't never seen the kind of thing you're talking about. You're just a dreamer. Yeah, I know I am. That makes me a child of Joel chapter 2. He said, in the last days, old men will dream dreams. You call me crazy, but I'm just crazy enough to dream that God wants to save this whole city. All of them. Every single one. Starting with the mayor all the way to the gutter bum. I'm just dreaming dreams. He said, put out your nets. Peter said, well, we've been doing this. We've got calluses and blisters. See that? Our backs are tired. We've already got the nets washed. We put everything away. And last I heard, you were born in Nazareth. How much fishing they used to do down in Nazareth? Wasn't that a landlocked town? We're professional seamen. Isn't it amazing how we can explain away the word of the Lord? He said, none of it makes sense. It doesn't make sense. I'm pretty faithless. Nevertheless, at thy word, we will do it. I like, the, I like people who obey just because. And here's the beautiful thing. In spite of his half-hearted faith, in, in spite of his soft resistance, resistance it was, it was soft, he wasn't ugly about it. Some people just get downright ugly about it. If I'm going to have to work in the nursery, i just soon go to hell. That must be what it is because we have over 100 people that we've done a background check on who are all qualified to work in the nursery and we cannot hardly get three people in there at a time to save our neck. But I digress. The thing of it is we need you all to show up because God's going to send us 100 babies and three people can't handle 100 babies. You ought to go back there sometime too because we have the prettiest babies in town. If you go back there, you'll really get hooked. But anyway, he said, I'll put down the net. He calls us to be instruments of evangelism and to obey his word and to do the praying and do the work and do the inviting and go into the marketplace and cast the nets. He said, we will do it. And even though his faith was half-hearted and his resistance was very real, Jesus filled the nets anyway. I love it. We don't have to have perfect faith. God enlarged my faith. He says, I've given every man a measure of faith, and if you'll just walk in that, I'll fill the nets. We've got enough. We've got enough faith in this church to win this city. We've got enough. They obey. They take him at his word. Number three, they humble themselves in his presence. When Peter and the others saw the blessing that Jesus had given him, that he had used them to gather fish in spite of their half-hearted obedience, when that happened, they came down off of their high-minded, self-righteous, I thank God that I'm not like other men. I'm not surprised that God is blessing our church. We have a special church. No, we don't have nothing. We just got an old stinky boat that he's turned into a saving station by his presence. 
This is nothing but a barn for the harvest. Just a barn. That's all it is. It's a barn. A brick barn. But there's nicer barns than this in horse farms not less than three miles from here. It's a barn. It's not great for any other reason except because of his presence. And they recognized they didn't catch those fish because of the quality of their sanctuary or the skill of their fishing or the abundance of their resources. They caught the fish because they were in the presence of the man that made the fish. And they threw themselves at, their, at his feet and humbled themselves. If we will come down off of our high horse and recognize that we are nothing but sinners saved by grace, such, such, you can look at every situation, no matter how dire it may be, but except for the mercy of God, any one of us could be right there. It's only His mercy that separates us from the lowest of the low. This is too good to tell you, so I'm going to read it. Cocky, arrogant, Witnesses, high-minded followers of Jesus. If we hope to win the city, let us awaken to the fact that we too are a band of half-hearted, faithless, imperfectly obedient, justified sinners, totally unworthy of any blessing we've ever received especially the matter of salvation. If we can come to that conclusion, we may finally be ready to fish. That is good preaching, Mitchell. <laughs> Praise God. I'm going to give myself an offering. Number four. They treasure Christ above everything when they come to the full realization that the great catch was a result of being in the presence of a great God. They brought their boats to land and they forsook everything and followed Him. Those are the characteristics of those who catch men. When we're half-hearted, when we just as soon stay home and watch television as go to church, when we get as excited about as a UK basketball game as we do a Sunday morning service, when our devotions and our affections are divided between God and the things of this earth, he said, if any man love the world and the things of the world, the love of the Father is not in him. The divided heart will never catch men. The sold out. Some of you began that journey two weeks ago. I'm wanting you to go to the next step of picking up your nets with your exhausted arms. Obeying the word of the Lord and casting them into the black sea. Having no idea that beneath the surface there's a miracle about to take place for you. Anybody like to see a miracle? But we're seeing miracles every day. Every time that I have anything to do with Growth Temple, I see a miracle. I believe God is so in this. I'm going over to talk to them when I leave here. I can't wait to go over because i got good things to say. I want them to know I believe in you. I believe in your pastor. I believe in his anointing and his calling. I think God is going to raise you up to save us section of this city that we can't touch. We're investing in you. We believe in you. We're praying for you. We're connected to you. I can't wait to tell them. But I want you to know I feel that way about you. You didn't just stumble in here. You're part of the divine plan of God. You're here. God always blends congregations with people from every walk of life. And he ends up with this unique hybrid that doesn't exist. No other church in this city has this particular blend of talent or lack thereof. This, pretended, this blend of education or lack thereof. This blend of color and experience or lack. Whatever we've got here, God put it all together for his own divine purposes. And you're part of that. You see that? You're part of that. And God's calling you now to the next place. To the place of obedience. Nevertheless, nevertheless, at thy word, stand up. <laughs>